chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. Um, I was studying this this past couple weeks, and it's been, uh, it's been so burdened on my heart, and I had no idea why the Lord has burdened something like this on my heart to such an extent. I didn't understand it. I've done a lot of studying. I've met a lot of people to ask questions, and the topic that I'm speaking on is the Holy Spirit. And I believe that it is God's perfect timing and perfect purpose for our pastor to have said that he has felt the Holy Spirit be grieved because in Ephesians chapter number four, Paul tells us to grieve not the Holy Spirit and beforehand he tells us how we grieve the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter number four, beginning in verse number 30, the Bible says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you once again for letting us meet in your house, give us direction and guidance, and we will honor you and glorify you through everything that happens, Lord. Bless this book. It's in your son's perfect and precious name I pray. Amen. Won't keep you long, um, but I do believe the Lord has um, a purpose for this and a purpose for what, uh, what possi can possibly be said. Throughout the Bible, the Lord tells us that we can do a lot of things to the Holy Spirit. He tells us that we can vex him, hinder him, quench him, resist him, push him away, not even want him. And we can get to the point to where we don't even know when he is trying to talk to us anymore. The Holy Spirit is the most sensitive person that meets with us every time we come into this house. He is also the only person that you ought to want to please every time you come into this house. I would rather offend each and every one of you. And I, I honestly don't care as long as the Holy Spirit himself is not grieved. And we ought to be very cautious, not just in here, but each and every day of our lives to ask ourselves, am I grieving the Holy Spirit? Or are you even in touch enough with the Holy Spirit to know, I just grieved the Holy Spirit. I just quenched the Holy Spirit. I just pushed the Holy Spirit away from me. And if you're a father and a mother, you don't only push him away from you, but you push him away from your household, which means you push him away from your wife and your kids and all the people around you. We ought not grieve the Holy Spirit, Paul says. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. The Bible tells us we can vex him, hinder him, push him away. And he tells us earlier on in the same chapter how we do that. How we do that. Early on in this chapter, he tells us that we do that by a loss of feeling, a loss of consciousness. We are saved and we have the new man inside of us, yet we still choose to have, have lasciviousness in our minds and uncleanness in the decisions we make. And it makes us to where we have no more conviction. We have no more feeling to what needs to happen and what needs to be done. We have no conviction of, I ought not do that. I ought not say that. I shouldn't hang out with these people. I shouldn't be thinking this. I shouldn't be doing this right now. And you need to know when the Holy Spirit is talking to you, friend, because the most important person in your life is the Holy Spirit of God. Once you accepted him as your savior, he entered inside of your soul and it is then your choice to choose to have a close relationship with the Holy Spirit of God. Or you can push him away and hurt yourself in the end. You should want conviction. You should want to come into this church house and feel convicted and feel uncomfortable and be to the point where you say, oh my goodness, I need to go to the altar and ask for forgiveness. You should want conviction, friend. We oftentimes come to this house with a do not disturb sign on our foreheads. I want to come into the church house and I want what, what the pastor has, but you don't really want it. You don't really want what the Holy Spirit has for you when you come into this place. And it is sad that we have churches falling apart because we are not in tune with the Holy Spirit of God. I thank God every day for a pastor who is understanding and he can discern and he knows when we have grieved the Holy Spirit as a church. He told us just a little bit ago, I, have, I felt that I have grieved the Holy Spirit. His conscience is not gone yet. And you should want to be the same way. You should want to know when the Holy Spirit tells you something. You should want to know when he tells you not to do something and when he tells you to do something. You should want to be uneasy in the church house. You should want to have an uncomfortable feeling. You should want to come to the altar. You should want to say, God, I need you more because we do. We need the Holy Spirit indwelling inside of us, indwelling on top of us. Along with the Holy Spirit comes the power. The power to make a difference. The power to make a difference in that world. The power to make a difference in each other's lives. Our pastor gets up here and preaches. And he has begged before he gets up here for the power. He knows that he needs the power. 
He knows that he has to have the Holy Spirit dripping off of him in order to make a difference in our lives. Because it's not him that's making a difference. It is the Holy Spirit of God through him. He was just willing to get sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit to be used by the Holy Spirit. He knows his convictions. We ought to know our convictions as Christians. We ought not lose feeling. We ought not lose the feeling of conviction and uncomfortableness when we come into this house. Secondly, we see that we grieve the Holy Spirit because we love the flesh. We lost our convictions and then we tend to love our flesh. He tells us that, Paul tells us that, that when you're saved, the new man enters inside of you and we have to put away the old man. What do you mean by put him away though, Paul? I asked myself and I asked the Lord, well, what does it mean to truly put away the old man? It means to crucify your flesh every day of your life. Every hour, every moment, you must crucify the flesh because your flesh will deceive you, friend. Your flesh wants you to mess up. Your flesh wants you to make a mistake. Your flesh will get you straight to hell, friend. You have to have the Holy Spirit. If salvation was 99.9% .9 God and that 0.1% us, we would all burn in a devil's hell one day. We have to have the Holy Spirit of God. We have to crucify our flesh and put away that old man. Your flesh will deceive you. Your flesh will confuse you. Peter, we find Peter in the Bible. He, Jesus says, who do people say that I am? In the book of Matthew, and, and the disciples say, oh, well, some people say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're a prophet. Some say this and some say that. And he said, no, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And he wanted the disciples to say, who is it that you say that I am? And Peter, I identify with Peter in a lot of ways. Peter's a loud mouth. He's got a big personality. He tends to catch himself in a stupid situation. I'm the same way. Peter outspoke and he said the right thing. He said, you are the son of the living God. And God says, I am. You are right. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And five verses later, he looks Peter directly in the eyeballs and he says, get thee behind me, Satan. Because our flesh can deceive us, friend. You can be in complete fellowship with Christ one moment and not crucify your flesh when you're supposed to. And just like that. You don't have that fellowship anymore. Peter steps out of the boat and has faith, and he walks on water. And instantly, he starts to sink. He got distracted by the things of the world. We get distracted by our flesh, by the people around us. We need to be in fellowship and in tune with the Holy Spirit enough to know that you know that you know when he is talking to you directly. When you lose your feeling, you, don't, you won't even know eventually when he's talking to you. You won't know. Our flesh will deceive us. It'll take us down some wrong roads. Some situations that you wish you'd never been in. The reason you got there is because you followed your heart, your emotions, your flesh, and you did not follow the Holy Spirit. Growing up, my dad used to say, you're either going to obey me or you're not. He would give me a list of things to do. And he'd say, now you're either going to obey me or you're not. Halfway doing that list was not obeying dad. Obeying him was doing everything he told me to. You are either led by the Holy Spirit or you're not. There is no in between. You either have 100% reliance on the Holy Spirit to make your decisions for you or you don't. You don't get to choose to say, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit lead me this moment and then a few hours later say, well, I kind of want to get in my flesh this moment. No, we have to have the Holy Spirit and dwell inside of us and on top of us every moment of every day or you will never make a difference for what we're supposed to make a difference for. And that is for the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. Not only do we lose our convictions and we love our flesh, but we have a lying tongue. The Bible, in, in the book of James, the Bible tells us that your tongue is from hell, pretty much. That's what it says. Read the book of James sometimes. It talks about your tongue. Let me tell you something about your tongue. It can bring forth death or it can bring forth life. Your tongue is powerful. Your tongue is powerful. You can say something about someone and get them arrested for the rest of their life. You can say something about someone and they'll, never, they'll lose their job. Your tongue can ruin someone's life. Or it can help somebody. It can bring forth life. 
It can, it, it, can, it can do something to glorify God and help the people around you. Oftentimes in the church, we find ourselves using our tongue for something we ought not be using our tongue for. We talk about things we shouldn't talk about. We think about things we shouldn't think about. Our tongue, as believers, ought to lift each other up, no matter what. This, this, is, this is having the Holy Spirit and dwelling inside of you, knowing that you can go to somebody and you know they're not going to put you down or put anybody else down, but instead they're going to glorify God and edify the Lord and edify the saints of the church and build you up without putting somebody else down. The only thing they do is build people up. When you are endued and have that power, you have that ability for someone to know that they can go to you and they don't have to worry about you saying something that you shouldn't say at all. At all. Not at all. Not just a little something here and there, but they know that you're not going to say something you shouldn't say, and they know it. That is having the Holy Spirit upon you. Us as Christians, when we go to Walmart, when we walk through Lowe's and Home Depot, people ought to look at us and say, what is different? That is the power. You have to have the power as a Christian. The Lord told the disciples Terry in Jerusalem, wait, wait, don't go preach, wait until you are endued with the power from on high. It's not endued from our power, from our might. It's not endued by you studying. It's not by your knowledge of studying. It is endued by the Holy Ghost of God. It is having the Holy Ghost touch you in a way you've never been touched before, making a difference in your life that you would never understand. You'll start making decisions that people will think, why are you making that decision? Because you are led by the Holy Spirit of God. I have a friend, a friend, he's 23 years old. His name's Zach Fuller. He's a preacher, lives down in Georgia. I just met him a little while back. He was a great football player in high school. Got a college scholarship, went to play football in college. They were telling him that he was going to go. I mean, he was going to make it. He was starting on offense freshman year, three votes away from being captain of the team as a freshman in college. That's a big deal. He got halfway through training. Season was about to start. His dad's a pastor. And he went to his dad and he said, Dad, the Lord's telling me to quit football. Full ride scholarship. Full ride, everything paid for. He said, the Lord's telling me to quit football. His dad said, you crazy. What you thinking? They took a chance on you. You start and you're going to make it somewhere. What are you thinking? He said, Dad, I'm sorry. i got to listen to the Lord. i got to listen to the Holy Spirit. For a 23-year-old man, young man, young man, to make a decision like that, man, he had to humble himself. They called him into the office a few weeks later. His dad is still telling him he was crazy. you nuts. You're giving up something like that. They called him in. They said, we want you to be a part of this program. Secular college. I want you to be a part of this program. We want you to be a character coach. Not only that, but we're going to pay you for it. His dad came up to him and he said, son, I'm proud of you for being sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God. He made the right decision. He is now traveling and preaching and doing the will of God, making a difference he would have never had the opportunity to make on that football field. Because he was willing to make a change, a big change in his life, because he was willing to be endued and have the power of God and make that decision by following the leading of the Holy Spirit. You have to follow the Spirit of God. You're either led by the Spirit of God or you're not. There is no in between. There's no in between. We lose feelings and we grieve him and we get rid of him and we push him away. In this same chapter, Paul says, give no place to the devil. No place. Nothing. Don't crack the door. Don't give him an inch. Don't do nothing. How devoted are you to Jesus Christ? Yeah. I have to ask myself this, and I have to be convicted myself when I ask you this, but how devoted are you to this Bible? How devoted are you to Jesus? Yeah. I'm not just talking about a 45-minute devotion every day. You work for eight hours, you sleep for eight hours, that gives you eight hours left. If you live for 60 years, that means you're only alive and wake for 20. What are you doing with that time? What are you doing? How devoted are you to God? You're devoted to that, that, that program or you're devoted to watch that football game. You're devoted to this and you're devoted to that. But are you devoted to actually spend hours 
among hours with the Lord. And I'm not just talking about studying and thinking that you're smart and thinking that you've come up with some great thing to tell people, but that you actually get down and you're devoted enough to the Holy Spirit to open your heart and open your soul and say, talk to me, Lord. Speak to me. Give me something that nothing else can give me, that no one else can give me. I can come up with the best outline. I can think I'm the smartest person. But that means nothing without the Holy Spirit of God. We have to have the power. You have to have the power. It's not just meant for the preachers. It's not just meant for the preachers. If you want to play that piano and make a difference, you have to have the power. If you want to sing, you have to have the power. When you walk out of these buildings, people need to know that you have the power. What is it? It's the power. What are you willing to give up to get that power? What are you willing? Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with the power. And if you have a Scofield Study Bible in the book of Matthew, it says that they were preparing to get the power or something like that. They, the 10 days, it took them 10 days. They met together in a room for 10 days and prayed to get the power. And it was not just men. There were some women with them. Which tells me that it is not just the preacher. It is not just the man that gets up here and leads the congregational hymns. But it is every man, every woman, every person who is conscious and knows what is happening. It is time to give up our flesh and devote ourselves to get that power. We need that power. We need that difference in this world. You have to have the power. You have to immerse yourself. In Jesus. Immer I mean drown yourself in Jesus Christ. You get up at 6 o'clock for work. I'm talking like get up at 4 o'clock to spend 2 hours with God. And immerse yourself in that book. And immerse yourself saying God talk to me. It was worth getting up early. It was worth begging for this. It will be worth it when you get to power. I promise because the peace that comes from it is not your satisfaction. But it's the satisfaction you have of serving and making a difference for your Lord. How devoted are you to get that power? We need it. Every one of us need it. If you are saved in this house this morning, the Lord has saved you from a devil's hell. It is time for you to crucify your flesh. Give up your selfish desires. Me as well. And we need to get devoted to this book. And we need to get devoted in spending some time with the Holy Spirit of God. Because the Holy Spirit is the one of the Godhead on this earth to comfort us. And to fill this building. And to make a difference. We need that power. I'll say it a thousand times. We need the power. Churches are losing members, falling apart. Everything is emotional. Everything is led by your heart. No, we need the power. We need to be led by the Spirit of God in every situation. You immerse yourself in the book by letting God talk to you. Letting God talk to you. Listen now. I'm not talking about you reading your Bible and just kind of saying, oh, I'm going to read this. I'm going to read so many chapters, this and that. Or I'm going to get down and I'm going to pray and I'm going to start talking to God. I mean, get down, be quiet, somewhere where nobody else is with you and say, God, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait for you to talk to me. I'm going to wait for you to say something to me. And I'm ready for the funny farm when I say this, but let me tell you something, friend. If you get alone with God, if you get in that closet and you set this book in your lap, put it to your face and you say, God, I'm going to sit here until you talk to me. It might take 10 minutes. It might take 10 hours. It might take 10 days of doing that over and over and over again. But it will be worth it because he has talked to me, friend. He has come down and told me exactly the decision I ought to make when I've been broken between making a decision and one pastor friend says to do this, and another pastor friend says to do that, and another man of the church says to do this, and another man of the church says to do that, that's when I realized there's only one mediator. The men of God, the men of this church will help you and give you direction. But friend, when all those pastors, great pastors, men of God, were giving me, trying to give me direction, and they all had a different outlook on it, that's when I realized I have to be led by the Spirit of God. I don't just listen to everything a man tells me. The first person you go to ought to be Jesus. Every time. 
every time. Not your wife, not your husband, not your kids, not your pastor. But it ought to be God himself, friend. Get to that mediator between you and God, the man Christ Jesus. And say, Lord, I need to talk to you today. I need a decision. I need discernment and I need wisdom. He will talk to you, friend. He will talk to you to get the power to not grieve him, to make a true difference. You have to immerse yourself in talking to God. Truly be devoted. And you got to talk straight to him. Straight to him. You got to be frank. We have these polished prayers. We have polished sermons. We have everything looking good, sounding good. Everything looks right. Everything sounds right. I can get up here and pray a pretty prayer. Pastor says it all the time, but it means nothing. Absolutely nothing. God knows everything about you. You ought to let him open your heart and open your soul. And when you get down and pray to God, what are you trying? What, what makes you think you can hide it from him? What makes you think that he's stupid? You're stupid. He knows everything about you. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows when you looked at that. He knows when you said that. He knows when he told you don't do this and you did it anyways. He knows. When you pray to God, be honest. Open your soul and say, Lord, I'm nothing but a sinner. Even when I want to do good, my flesh tells me to do bad. He knows anyways. What are you trying to hide? What are you trying to hide? For this church to prosper, for this church to grow, for one day I would love to see this church grow, have to get a bigger building, make huge plans. I think God can do something like that, but it will not happen if we grieve the Holy Spirit of God because he will not meet with us if we grieve him. Each and every one of us ought to beg for that power. How many meals are you willing to fast, men? And I understand some people aren't capable of that due to health issues and whatnot, but how much do you want it? And then once you get it, you ought to hope everybody else gets it. And you ought to pray for everybody else to get it. Men, when's the last time you woke up in the morning and said, Lord, my family, fill them with the power. Wash them in the Holy Spirit. When's the last time you got up and said, Lord, touch my husband with the Holy Spirit. Fill my kids with the Holy Spirit. Make sure they follow the Holy Spirit. Make sure they're led by the Holy Spirit. Make sure they don't get there. Make sure they don't go there. Make sure they don't get to that point. But let them make a decision with you today that they will be immersed with your word. We need it. And then we ought to pray for each other. We ought to pray for each other. I don't know where I would be right now if my grandparents did not pray for me. Things happen. Family issues happen. I'm living out there for the world. Living for the world. Just hippity hoppity, no big deal, no problem. I could have ended up anywhere. I could have ended up making a mistake that would have changed my life. I never would have preached again. I was called without repentance. We are called to serve God without repentance. But my grandparents, every day, I know it. They woke up and they prayed for me. How many of you are going to have somebody in your life that will say, I know that they prayed for me every day of my life. I know it. I know that they wanted me to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. I know that they wanted me to get that power. It's quiet. Oh, it's quiet. Hear a pin drop on this carpet floor right now. We need the power, friend. We need it. The men of old got up and preached and, and, and they preached their hearts out and people came to the altar in anguish. Anguish, if you listen to the audios of men of old, they got down and people would come to the altar and you can hear them in the background saying, God, we need you. Why don't we want him like that no more? Why? Why can't we crucify our flesh enough to say, God, we need you. We need that power. 
We ought to beg for it as a church. For hours, among hours, among hours, we need to be begging for that power. We are missing the power. Gone. It ain't here sometimes. No one wants to get it. No one's willing to have enough conviction, enough standards, devote themselves enough to get that power. We need to be freshly anointed every day of our lives. Freshly anointed every day of our lives. Or we will never make the difference we are supposed to make. We have to have the power. When we leave here tonight, the one thing I want you to remember is to ask yourself, am I in tune enough with the Holy Spirit to know when he's telling me, do this, don't do that. Even when it's the craziest decision you can make, you ought to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because, friend, you are either led by the Holy Spirit or you are not. There is no in-between. No in-between. Whatsoever. We need the power. We're missing the power. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. Once again, I thank you for another day of life, God. I thank you for giving us the opportunity to meet in your house and to open your word and to, to just let you come down and, and talk to us, God. It's not in our might. It's not in our strength. It's not in anything we say or anything we do. But it's by the Spirit of God that a difference can be made. Lord, I pray for our pastor. I love my pastor. I love my pastor, Lord. You know that I love my pastor. Give him discernment. Give him wisdom. Lord, I pray for each and every person in our church. Every one of them, Lord. That they would be endued with that power. But I cannot do it for them. Pastor cannot do it for them. But Lord, I pray that they would realize the necessity it is. How they have to have it. It's not just something we should want, but it is something that we should realize that we need. We need the power. You're a good God, Father. Thank you for everything you've given us. I pray that we would be led by you as we walk out these doors. Not just tonight, not just tomorrow, not just next week, but until the day that we die. No matter how many friends leave us, no matter if we lose our job, no matter what happens, Lord. No matter if you tell us to go across the world, across the country, across town, to do something that just seems kind of crazy. But as long as it's been led by the Holy Spirit of God, that we would follow that and be in tune enough to know when you're telling us what to do. It's in your son's perfect and precious, most righteous name I pray. Amen. Amen.